All right, what's up everybody? We'll go ahead and get started here in just a moment. But if you can hear us and if we're streaming in 1080p, also if you can rewind, just go ahead and give us a thumbs up in the chat and we'll get started here in a moment. Thank you all for joining. All right, everybody, I think we can go ahead and get started here. Please excuse the uh, <laughs> kind of interesting setup we got. I'm a little bit disorganized tonight, but that's okay. So good evening, everybody, and welcome back to Walks and Wall Street. Today is March 21st, 2024. It's about 9.19 p.m. Eastern time, and we are reporting live right here outside the office, 575 Madison Avenue on the corner of East 56th Street and Madison. Now as a quick review, obviously as we head in here towards Friday, happy Thursday by the way, uh, it was a major week in not only the US equity markets, but really global, uh, on a global scale. I would say number one, historically, the Bank of Japan or the BOJ have decided to raise interest rates from negative territory to 0%, so no longer negative interest rates. Oh, hold on, I got a crazy guy. Hold on. All right, he's gone. Uh, decided to raise interest rates from negative interest rates to 0%. So no longer is Japan in an era of negative interest rates. Now, Japan is open for trading right now. I want everybody to take a look at the Japanese equity market. Uh, new fresh all-time record high into the print yet again on the open. Uh, and this is something we've been watching and writing about for well over a year. Um, we've successfully forecasted this uh, coming bull market in Japan. So I want to just quickly take you guys behind the desk here uh, and show you a visual. Let me just flip to the monthly time frame. And we're going to be doing, we're going to start, start another channel so you guys can see this a little bit better. Um, but take a look at this. Hold on. So this is a snapshot of the Japanese equity indices. Uh, it hit a top in 1989 and has pretty much gone down to sideways in a multi-decade, multi-generation bear market. And uh, now we are just punching through these brand new all-time record highs for the first time since 1989. I think this has a lot of room. This is like inning one of a potential massive super cycle uh, for Japan. Obviously, they just opened and we're printing into the highs. Uh, we'll take a look at the US. S&P 500 was a gap and go day. Uh, 
again in the new all-time record highs for the S&P 500. However, I am a little bit concerned here because we are getting, I mean, grossly extended above major moving averages such as the 50-day and the 200-day. And we have a little bit of a gap in the futures and in the cash. The S&P 500 closed up just under a half a percentage point. Uh, up 16 points, 5,241 new all-time record highs across the board as we head to the Dow Jones Industrial Average. That was up 269 points, closing at a cash close of 39,781. Uh, markets are rocking, but we're now gapping up. And, uh, you know, anybody who is long, you're probably feeling well. Um, and it might be a good time to pick up some... Uh, hedges, some protection on your positions, because chances are, if you were in any of these true market leaders, I mean, you're up, you're up big, and in a bull market, the TMLs tend to correct and have gyrations down to their 50 days. So you want to be able to sit through that. And if you look at the VIX, the CBOE volatility index, we absolutely collapsed in the VIX today, all the way down to about 1241. But we were pretty pretty much sucked up throughout the day. So if you think about purchasing uh, insurance on any of your positions, you're actually not going to be paying that much uh, if you look at the, the VIX because, uh, you know, on the put side of the market, you could actually probably get some pretty good deals if you're hedging your positions or something like that. All right, guys, I'm going to go ahead and close up this laptop here. Uh, we'll get the stream kicked off. I really do appreciate everybody joining. Um, and yeah, we'll get started. Just a quick announcement. Uh, we did send out our behind the street newsletter on Thursday. Um, we wrote about not only the US equity market, but emerging markets, fixed income, and monetary and fiscal policy. If you'd like to receive all of our free market research, just go ahead, scan the QR code on your screen and punch in your email or type exclamation point news N-E-W-S in the chat, and the Nightbot will drop the link to our um, Substack. All right, give me a second and we will get started. Thanks, everybody. Whew, man, it's another cold night in the city. You know, it's crazy because uh, it is spring. I think we're now in, what, the second day of spring. But guys, it is absolutely, I mean, absolutely freezing out in New York. I don't know what's going on. Because it seemed like this winter was pretty tame and pretty mild, right? Um, <laughs> but then kind of once we actually officially started spring, everything uh, kind of went the other way on us, which is a little crazy. Anyway... All right, so let's quickly take a look at the beautiful 432 Park Avenue. Now, the building you're looking at right now is one of the most sought-after, luxurious, and expensive buildings on New York City's Billionaire's Row. The developer is Harry Mackelow, and he also did the largest office-to-condominium conversion in New York City's history. That is One Wall Street. Uh, but let's go ahead and, and start to head towards uh, Midtown tonight. It's windy. I would have started in Lower Manhattan, but it's just too windy tonight. Uh, D, what's going on? Good to see you. Thanks so much for joining. I see KML. Appreciate it. Trade Brigade, what's going on? Thanks so much um, for joining us. I'm sure you were quite interested in today's market action with the you know, major indices gapping up. Uh, you know, pretty extended here, but I mean, wow, talk about strength in the market. Um, Peter, what's up? Says these gyrating temperatures are rather upsetting. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's one way to think about it. Definitely pretty upsetting, right? Sally, what's going on? Thanks for joining us. Patrick, New York, DM. Uh, says the month of March has very varied weather. I agree. I definitely agree. Uh, who else we got? Robert, what's going on? Evan Weeks, thanks so much for joining. Um, ah, Evan Weeks, Tom, got a question for you. 
In an interview with the CIO of a small REIT real estate investment trust focus firm, I asked the person, what is your company doing to position themselves to deal with the fallout of the commercial real estate market? She had zero answer for me and said the company doesn't even advertise clients to come to them. Uh, how does that make you feel? Uh, that seems like a pretty strange answer. <laughs> that seems like a pretty strange answer to me. You'll have to email me who the uh, who that person was. Uh, RPT, this is office all move. Yeah, so we, we moved our office. All the moving is good. And I actually like our new office better. So crypto meme, what's going on? Thanks so much for joining. Michelle K, Unij23. You know, even more encouraging action in the market. I know we talked about this yesterday. But the number one thing that I'm looking at right now is this continued follow through in small caps, particularly the Russell 2000. Uh, so if you want to look at the Russell 2000 ETF, um, just go ahead and look up the ticker symbol IWM. And we gapped up today and we tried to break out over that handle. Um, you know, that should really be your gauge uh, for breadth of the market. If we can have small caps come out here uh, and really charge ahead, once you get that kind of rotation out of these big mega caps, that's going to keep this market afloat. And I mean, this is about as strong of a market as I've ever traded in, ever, in my entire life. Um, not to sound like a broken record, but I mean, this is strong. You know, we, you should be doing post analysis of exactly what happened after that lockout rally as we were emerging from COVID, right? Um, so many people thought the market was going to continue to, you know, roll over in some sort of... Uh, a bear market rally and kind of roll over that never happened coming out of the 2020 crash instead the nasdaq and the s p rode their 21 day moving averages all the way up in new highs um so this seems to be a pretty pretty strong lockout rally now what i'm looking forward to well hopefully nothing is ever guaranteed to happen as we're making this left hand turn by the trump tower there's going to come an opportunity in the market. It's not if, it's when, right? Stocks don't only go up in a straight line. But when this market pulls back and you have a material, I would say, first correction in the, uh, in the market, right? When the indices pull back, you're going to get really good opportunities to then size in to the TMLs, the true market leaders that have, are now pulling back and building their stage two bases, right? So if you're in these names already, you know, we kind of talked about the VIX, the CBOE volatility index, uh, the VIX got punished, came really, you know, it got sucked back off the lows of the day. So as this market gets extended and you're in all these names that we've been talking about, right, as assuming, um, now is not the worst time to kind of have those hedges on because they're going to be rather inexpensive. Um, because the VIX is super low, right? Now, you may lose money on those hedges as the market goes up, but you're really going to want to have those on uh, when this market pulls back so you don't really get shaken out of your core uh, holdings, right? And then as those stocks set up again, you can reload uh, as they break into new highs. Now, that seems so much easier said than done. I mean, this market doesn't have to do anything, but that's kind of uh, what I'm hoping for. Hey, stance is a VIX at 12 and 13 is definitely okay with me. Uh, trade brigades is new highs versus new lows, also breaking out to a massive high on the NYSE as a full exchange strong day. Yeah, um, you know, MarketSmith has a really good kind of like market to breakdown section on the NYSE. I look at new highs, new lows. I also look at up to down volume on a lot of these uh, stocks too. But yeah, I mean, this is like really textbook bull market action here. This is the St. Regis Hotel, but you also have the Polo Club. We'll take a look over here. Oh yeah, Alan says, how about the Reddit IPO today? I think the stock was up like what, 
20 was it I didn't really watch it it was either 70 percent or 20 percent I, I forget the headline this is the polo bar by Ralph Lauren St. Regis right here now if I'm not mistaken with reddit becoming public today I think that was the first social media companies since Pinterest to come public I think now does anybody use Pinterest I don't even remember the last time I've been on that website but this is the Peninsula Hotel what year did Pinterest come public 2017 I think it trades under the ticker symbol PINS pins uh, I think I don't, I don't even really track the stock but look I think that's good news deals being done uh, means that the market is opening up and this is something we also talked about you know the return of the IPO market and I think what I think the deal that really solidified the return of new IPOs was the arm transaction right ticker symbol ARM and uh, you know that that deal that was able to get done it was a massive deal that kicked off kind of this deal making boom on uh, the street uh, trade brigade says reddit up to an intraday high of 23 percent pulled back to close at 7.5 percent now trade brigade I got a really good book recommendation I think you'd enjoy this if you email if you email me I'll send you the book um, the book is called um, Life Cycle Trade. This is the university club that we're looking at, by the way. It's a beautiful building. Uh, but since we're talking about IPOs, and now that the IPO market is really picking up, everybody should go ahead and go out and buy this book. You know, you can get it used off of Amazon for like 10 bucks. Uh, it's called Life Cycle Trade. The author is Eve Bobak and Kathy Donnelly now Eve Bobak was a former employee of the Federal Reserve now she runs one of the small cap funds at Ropel Capital Management I think it's about a hundred it's a it's about a hundred million dollar fund and the firm did a study a 40 I think a 40 year study going back through every single IPO I uh, just don't want to get hit by the food delivery bike guys um, well essentially the book did a study on every single new IPO I think going back 40 or 50 years right and they did a complete analysis breaking down the top performing IPOs of all time and garnering all of their characteristics right oh look at this everybody's getting out of St. Thomas Church nice is it a religious holiday today I mean I'm Catholic I don't know I didn't know if there was a holiday anyway now the book goes back and studies how these IPOs trade uh, what were the characteristics of the best uh, performing IPOs of all time and what the book found is that or I should say what the study found is that after one year of trading activity an initial public offering or a new issue will undercut its IPO price at least once within that year so for investors it's actually probably better uh, to wait over a year before you buy a brand new IPO and there's a multitude of reasons for this because if you think about let's say if you get a job at you know an investment bank uh, or you know a big financial firm and you know you're working at a, a big mutual fund or something like that 
in order for your PM, right, your portfolio manager to add some of these names or these new issues to the portfolio, they're going to have to meet a certain set of characteristics, right? And when a company comes public, well, they haven't formally reported, you know, quarterly earnings. They've just given everybody projections and you have a little bit of diligence. So Wall Street really wants to make sure that they're meeting analyst expectations, if not beating expectations and raising forward guidance. So usually, right before you have a big fund on Wall Street, like any of the BlackRock funds, you know, the Barron funds, or any of these really, really good mutual funds, before they, you know, put in a very large position, they like to wait for a few quarters to roll out to see if management and see if the company is meeting those expectations. Is it meeting revenue estimates? Is it meeting earnings estimate? Is it meeting uh, you know gross margin estimates, right? And if it is, well then the analysts will go over to the PMs and they'll say, hey, we recommend this stock. Then they start a starter position in the company. We'll go this way. Uh, and over the next three, four years, if the company continues to meet and exceed and raise forward guidance, you're going to have so much institutional sponsorship in that name, and that's kind of when these stocks break out, right? Uh, because if we think about what an IPO is, right, in its purest form, it is the transfer of ownership of a company, right, from the private markets to the public markets. So you think about private equity, venture capital, all those VCs and the employees, it's transferring that ownership to the public market. And that's why you have a lot of these choppy IPO bases. There's a lot of volatility through there because there's a transfer ownership, right? So again, it's a really good book. It's called Life Cycle Trade by Kathy Donnelly and Eve Bobak. Really, two, two really, really smart uh, women on Wall Street. Again, Eve used to work for the Federal Reserve now she runs the small cap fund at Ropel Capital Management. Oh, Alfonso, so it's almost one week before Easter. Uh, that's why the church is getting busy again. Got it. Yeah, I think Easter's on the 31st, right? I always like looking at the facade of this building here. Almost looks like a crystal facade. Hey, Sharon is here. This is Tom, good to see you. Uh, Brian is here. Sabina Sanchez, the mighty bull. Hey, Brad, what's going on? Ken's says New York Rangers beat the Boston Bruins 5-2, love that. Celtech says, hey Tom, are you a chartist or a technician? Um, Oh, Palm Sunday is Sunday. Got it. I don't know. I would say I'm more of a techno fundamentalist. I'd say I would describe myself like that. A techno fundamentalist, probably. What about you? Sunshine after rain, welcome. Let me scroll up and see if I missed any comments. Hey, Ryan Beck, good to see you. What's going on from Dallas? Rainy Dallas, Texas, than a frigid, freezing cold uh, New York City. It's in the 30s again, unfortunately. Hey, Ace Options Trading, what's going on? Appreciate it. Carol H. Hey, Tom and friends. Carol, I should be down in Miami, Florida again. Uh, only for two days, though. I got to swap out at a tenant but I will be down there maybe next weekend so excited about that now right in here is MoMA everybody this is the Museum of Modern Art this is kind of like uh, what do you call it the gift store I guess they call it the gift store and then up here is the where you buy the tickets, the ticketing. And then all the way in the back is the entrance to MoMA. It's 
pretty cool. Now, since we're here, we'll check out 53 West 53rd. This is the main entrance to the museum, but they have it all blocked off because it's closed, obviously. Uh, but you got to look this building up. It's really, really cool. 53 West 53rd Street. It's uh, technically a Billionaire's Row building, but not on the physical street of Billionaire's Row. And it has a private restaurant for the residences of the building. Hey, DM, good to see you. Dog looks like a border collie or something, right? Hey, Surf's Flat. This is Hey Man, cheers, love the channel. Thank you so much, Surf's Flat Trader. I appreciate you very much. Thank you for joining us and welcome to New York City. Now, a trend on Billionaire's Row has been to have these over the top amenities. So, this is the private restaurant uh, for the residences in the building. It's similar to what you'll see at uh, 157 West 57th Street. Now that was the first building ever constructed on New York City's Billionaire's Row uh, and the developer is Extel. So Gary Burnett is the CEO and founder of Extel. Uh, for some Wall Street history here, I'm sure everybody's familiar with William Ackman or Bill Ackman of Pershing Square. 2014 157 West 57th Street was constructed and Bill Ackman, as well as a couple other investors at Pershing Square, purchased one of the most expensive units in the building. I believe they paid just under $100 million for that unit. I think they took a little bit of a loss on it. I believe they sold it. Um, but just three months ago, uh, a colleague of ours, uh, Noble Black from Douglas Elliman sold the entire 83rd floor of 157 for, how much was it? 32 million bucks, I think. I believe they listed it at $34 million and then they dropped the price to 32 uh, and it sold in less than two weeks. So it was a crazy, crazy deal. Uh, I'm not too sure who the owner was, but I believe they owned some sort of oil refinery business. This is Steinway Tower, one of the skinniest residential apartment buildings in the entire world. Christians, this is their chatter about the possibility of Trump's yeah so I mean I've heard about that I don't know if it'll get to that point I think that would be very that'd be a really big negative look on America I think if it got to that point not to get political but um, you know that's gonna send a really really bad message uh, to the rest of the world I don't think that's a good way to encourage capital, you know, creation and allocation in New York City. Um, I think they've taken all that stuff a little bit too far, in my view. But now this building over here, everybody, on the corner of West 54th Street and 6th Avenue is the Alliance Bernstein building. But uh, I think there's somewhere up here, uh, Fortress Investments. Uh, it was a major hedge fund that's in this building. Now, Mike Novogratz, if you do some research into him, uh, he got his start on Wall Street as, uh, I should say, working for Goldman Sachs. And he worked his way up towards partner. And he was a partner at Goldman Sachs when they went public. So you can imagine, you know, he must have been feeling pretty well. Uh, after Goldman, he took a job at Fortress Investments, did really, really well there. And now, he owns his own company. It's called Galaxy Digital. 
And essentially what Galaxy Digital does, it acts as an onboarding ramp for institutional investors, family offices, to gain exposure to the cryptocurrency world, uh, Bitcoin and such. So they actually headhunt a lot of junior investment bankers from you know, Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan, and a lot of the boutique investment banks like Jefferies, uh, Houlihan Loki, Evercore. Um, and that's where it seems like a lot of the talent is going these days towards, I guess you can call it, Web3 and blockchain. It's an interesting, it's an interesting company. The guy also has uh, a rather interesting podcast too. Josh Ellis's Planet Fitness lost value today as well. Yeah, um, that's another controversial thing. Talk, talking about controversy, uh, the world seems to be in no short supply of controversy. Now, I don't know the entire story, but I believe what happened was there was a guy, right, uh, who was using the women's locker room or the women's restroom at Planet Fitness, and it was reported to the staff, and the staff didn't do anything about it, and now people are protesting and canceling memberships, and people are upset. So yeah, big gyrations in the stock, for sure. Hey, Emanuel, what's going on? Good to see you. Uh, it says Fortress Investment Group was one of the first private equity firms to go public in the United States in 2007. In 2017, SoftBank acquired Fortress for around $3.3 billion. I didn't know Masasun acquired Fortress. Never knew that. Interesting. Um, yeah, uh, SoftBank is a Japanese company, big Japanese conglomerate, uh, headed by Masayoshi Sun or Masasun. Very, very... Now, Masasun is a, is a classic example of why the investment business is so great. Because uh, you only need to be right once to get really, really rich, right? Uh, and it's so true. Because Masasun has made some major, major bets and made tons and tons of money, but he's also made really, really horrible uh, bets and lost tons of money. But... I guess the, the, the lesson there is you got to take chances, you got to take calculated bets, and you got to get in the water to catch the wave and, and hit a big home run there. I think the biggest bundle, or bungle I should say, uh, by SoftBank was WeWork. I'm sure everybody would agree with that, right? Um, you know, Adam Newman, many of you may be familiar with that name, the founder and former CEO of the now bankrupt uh, WeWork, Masasun gave them billions and billions of dollars uh, and all of that was lost. Now, does anybody know the new startup, just out of curiosity, um, what's that new startup that Adam Newman is working on that's backed by Andreessen Horowitz? I'm blanking on the name. Uh, kind of like the, it's kind of like the same scheme as we work to be honest not to call it a scheme but i don't know will it work out we'll see uh, but maybe as we're doing the stream somebody could google the name of the company but mark andreessen of andreessen horowitz is backing the company quite significantly and i believe they're going to set up shop in fort lauderdale let me see if i can look it up on my other phone Hey, Chip Hunter. What's up, Chip? Thanks for joining. Hey, JC. What's going on? A little bit of the same concept with apartment buildings and co-working spaces in the apartment buildings, I guess. Now, I used to work at 1166 Avenue of the Americas. I used to be in corporate sales, uh, so enterprise sales at Sprint. And this was around the time when Marcelo was appointed as the CEO. And Marcelo obviously made like huge success. Uh, he sold his company, 
I believe, to SoftBank as well for over a billion dollars. The company was called Brightstar. And um, he was appointed as the CEO of Sprint because SoftBank had a majority stake in the company. So I was there through the merger. Well, it was really an acquisition by T-Mobile uh, through Sprint, but you know, there was one, and I always tell this story, but we do have a lot of new viewers. Uh, Marcelo and Adam Newman would come into our office all the time. And this was kind of right around the time when they were, you know, not too happy with one another, Marcelo, Moss's son, and Adam Newman. And the Sprint headquarters in New York City was this really nice layout that kind of mimicked, uh, kind of like a WeWork on steroids, so to speak. Like the coolest WeWork you've ever seen, that's kind of what our office was because we had such a big investment from SoftBank. All right, the Russian Tea Room and Carnegie Hall. Melts is a nonprofit I work for, created a co working space in a building that housed formerly homeless people. Interesting. This is 157. Justin says, any plans for the weekend? Not really. Hopefully it gets warm, it warms up. I think one of the things I'm sick of is the wind. I mean, this week has been nonstop 20 mile an hour winds. 20 mile an hour plus winds, I should say. Looks like there's a big venue coming out of Carnegie. try to navigate our way through this. <laughs> wow, pretty lively tonight, isn't it? Everybody's waiting to catch a cab. This is looking down towards Times Square. Let's head over one more block though to kind of get out of the crowd. I remember on the last stream, somebody asked me about a good uh, Irish bar or Irish pub. It's right here, it's called PJ Carney's. Uh, really good place, really cool place too. Always has a good environment. It's not one of those loud bars where there's a lot of rowdy, you know, young kids. It's like an older crowd, you know, more Central Park South type vibe. Yeah, Peters, the Sunday should be windy in New York City. You are likely below freezing tonight. Yeah, it feels like it. It's it's uh, freezing and it's windy. So you kind of get a double whammy. This 
This is Central Park Tower. There was just another record-breaking sale here just last week. I think they put uh, like a $36 million unit in contract. This is the tallest building on Billionaire's Row. 1,440 feet, I believe. Oh yeah, isn't the uh, March Madness starting already? Ah, Annyeonghaseyo, Iremi Moeyo. John Emiguk Saram EAO, thank you so much for the 2000 Korean won. Says, I want to live in Florida, Miami Beach. Well, you can, it's beautiful down there. Yeah, you know, Miami's a great place to visit. And it's definitely going to be a big change from Korea. So, I mean, you're more than welcome in Miami anytime. This is looking up towards the Trump Tower, one Central Park West. I didn't fill out my March Madness bracket. I usually do that every year. I, lo I love college basketball. I'm not a, like a huge basketball guy, but every year around March Madness, I absolutely love watching college basketball. So much more exciting than the NBA. Oh wow, the uh, Miami Open is going on now, I didn't know that. I know all the spring breaker, um, spring breakers and stuff is going on there, but the mayor of Miami really cracked down on all that craziness. Because last year, I mean spring break in Miami last year, was just way too out of hand. It was like borderline dangerous. I'm gonna take you guys all the way to Hell's Kitchen though tonight. So we're gonna go all the way over. And we'll walk all the way down. Now somebody today, I think it may have been Arsenal fan, sent me some renderings of the new Port Authority bus terminal project. It's going to be about a $10 billion project and they may actually start on it this year. I didn't even know about it. But if the city really does build a brand new and improved Port Authority, I mean, this city is going to be rocking and there's a lot of negativity on New York, right? And this kind of ties into the investment business because of contrarian thinking. I think the biggest and, and we could all probably agree the biggest contrarian in the real estate business was Sam Zell. Unfortunately, he passed away last year. Um, if you want to read just an unbelievable American success story. You got to read the story of Sam Zell. Now he came to the United States because his parents were fleeing Nazis, quite literally. And he grew up relatively poor uh, in Chicago and he went on to build a private equity real estate empire. His nickname was the Grave Dancer. And I think you're seeing a lot of similarities that's 
going to go on. It's already happening in New York City. Look at this thing. This looks pretty cool. Now you have a lot of distressed commercial real estate, particularly class B and class C office towers in New York that are under a lot of distress. And you're gonna have a lot of foreclosure auctions that a lot of people are gonna be a little bit squeamish to participate in. But I think if you participate, I think you're gonna make some money. Uh, I think there's a lot of money to be had here. Because the, what's creating the price, um, mispricing I should say in the marketplace is exactly what's going on. The migrant crisis, the crazy politics, the crime, you know, all the nonsense that you see in the media is creating this mispricing. But what is, it's essentially the market is assigning the valuations based upon a constant variable. And the constant variable being the crime, the crazy politics. And I don't agree. I don't think that all of this crime and the nonsense politics is going to be constant. I think it's going to change. And when it does change, well, guess what's going to happen to the prices? The prices are going to go back to where they were <laughs> plus 20. Uh, so if you have an environment, right, where the city is going through a really tough time and you have all these improvements that are happening that nobody's paying attention to, like the Pen 2 project that we just toured, uh, the brand new Port Authority bus terminal. Once the city really turns around, I mean, the people who were, you know, in it and betting big on New York City, you're going to make a lot of money. Uh, and I think you're seeing a similar thing happening in San Francisco, California, too. Now, this building with the gold top, everybody, this is the best selling building on New York City's Billionaire's Row. It is 220 Central Park South. It was developed by Vernado Realty Trust, so Steve Roth's company. And Citadel Securities' very own Ken Griffin owns three complete floors in the building, I think valued over $100 million. Now, speaking of more construction in New York City, right, more um, positive news, I want everybody to check out the new renderings of 350 Park Avenue. Once again, that is 350 Park Avenue. That is gonna be the brand new super tall building that is going to rival 270 Park Avenue. Jamie Dimon's office tower. And at 350 Park, Citadel is gonna occupy 54 floors in that building. Their temporary New York City headquarters is 425. Park Avenue. So, you know, people are still building. People are still investing heavily into these state-of-the-art office towers here. Hey, Chris, good to see you. Hey, Melissa 2087. This is a very busy night. Yeah, I noticed that too. Um, I mean, Midtown was packed. This is the Flame Diner. Pretty good diner, by the way. I usually come here and sit at the, the counter, the bar. That's my spot up there. And I always like to support the diners in Manhattan because these are small businesses. And unfortunately, a lot of these small mom and pop diners that have been around the city forever, they're going away because they can't keep up with the rent and they can't keep up with the big box chains. So if you ever get a chance to visit New York City, maybe you can come to the Flame Diner on the corner of 58th Street and 9th Avenue. It's open 24 hours a day and it's an original New York City diner. It's really good. Uh, I used to come in here almost every day because I went to college right here. Since we're in the neighborhood, we might as well check it out. Rockstar says, Tom, I'd invest in New York City real estate before the elections. 
That's an interesting uh, perspective, Rockstar, because I've been seeing a lot of comments over the past couple nights saying I'd only touch New York City real estate after, you know, all the Trump nonsense clears up. Well, then the price, you missed out on the discounts. <laughs> you see what I mean? The market is a discounting mechanism, both in equities and in real estate, right? It's forward looking by six months. So the prices that you're seeing right now in equities and the prices you're seeing right now in real estate are discounting six months ahead, right? So I think, uh, I think I agree with you, my friend. I think I agree with you. Hello, 69. Thanks so much for joining us. Five Bags of Popcorn is here too. Some of you guys have wild usernames, which I really enjoy. All right, so we are going to head to the John Jay College of criminal justice. You're gonna see a lot of these pretty cool pre-war buildings with those nice fire escapes. If you ever watch the show Law and Order, they film almost a part of every single episode uh, in this building coming up, which is where I went to college. And just to the right of us, is, uh, I'm blanking on the name of the hospital. I have the name in my head, but I forget. Hey, thank you so much, Kamsamnira, for the support. Ah, Mount Sinai Hospital, right here. Wow, guys, this is a power spaghetti. This building and this building, it used to be a restaurant called Stroko's. I'm not lying, that's what it was called. It was called Stroko's. Uh, now, this is all brand new. They restored the entire facade and they built a power spaghetti. You would think by reading the name power spaghetti, uh, you're like, oh, that's a French place. It's actually not, it's Korean, by the way. It's a, a Korean franchise, power spaghetti. I'm not sure if many of you knew that. Here's Mount Sinai West. This is the front of the hospital. Oh my God, Sam, what's going on? Sam's joining us from Canada. Hopefully I'll be making my way to Toronto this summer. That's uh, one of my goals. Haven't been to Canada in a very long time. All right, everybody, here is my alma mater. Now this is called the T building, by the way, but this is the very front of John Jay College of Criminal Justice. And the new building is all the way in the back. But pretty cool architecture on this one. Now, my freshman year, I had the majority of my classes in the new building, but sophomore year on, I had almost every class in this building right here, which is pretty much like a big prison. I'll try to uh, show you guys what it looks like inside. Now, back in the day, this used to be an all men's college because it used to act as a sort of like a, a cop college, as they called, almost 100% of the people who went to school here uh, were in the New York City Police Department, the NYPD. So this is called North Hall. There was no AC in here. You had the window ACs. None of them worked. But if you guys are enjoying the live stream so far tonight, feel free to leave a like on the video and click the subscribe button if you're new. We do these streams every night starting at 8.30 p.m. All right, so you can see John Jay College of Criminal Justice, North Hall. You guys are going to get a kick out of the inside. Now, it's abandoned. It hasn't been in use for, I think, four years now. And it looks exactly the same 
uh, from when I was going to class here. Super dated, everything looks like it's from the 1970s and they would film uh, Law and Order here a lot. Kind of looks like the place is falling apart a little bit. Now this used to be a big computer lab. Half the time the computers never really worked. Hey, Rafael is here from Puerto Rico. Hey, Rafael. Appreciate you joining us. Now this is pretty much what the inside of every hallway looked like. Just like big concrete blocks, really nothing, nothing special. And right across the emergency room. <laughs> yeah, Mel, it's like, that is a little prison-y, isn't it? I think the New York City now owns the building, or the NYPD now owns it again. I don't really know what's going on with it. <laughs> yeah, brutalism architecture similar to UMass. Yeah, I mean, you know, going to college in New York City, it's... Uh, I mean, if you, go to a key, if you go to a public school, I went to public school, right, in New York. Uh, this is it. It's just like very basic stuff. Not really a campus, just like a building. That's really about it. Now, in the CUNY system, right, City University of New York, uh, you do have a really, really good finance school that acts uh, as a feeder into a lot of the investment banks, uh, hedge funds, private equity firms, uh, and it's called Baruch, Baruch College, named after Bernard Baruch. Alright, we're going to cross over by 11th Avenue, and all the way, I would say, you can kind of see it better down there. Like, up here is all a lot of the older architecture. Down there, you can see directly into the Hudson Yards. And, you know, when I was, I would walk from 34th Street all the way up to 59th Street here, and there was none of those big, you know, super tall office buildings. There was none of those super tall skyscrapers for the condominiums. That was all built, you know, within the last 15 years, within the last 10 years. So, I mean, everything along the West Side Highway, 11th, like, I mean, they really, really built that up. Way back in the day, that used to be all these auto body shops, uh, like tire change places. It used to be, it used to be totally, totally different than what it is now. All right, guys, this is the new building. So this big skyscraper here is the new building at John Jay. And right here, I'm not sure if you could see it, there's actually an outdoor kind of observation roof deck where there's kind of like a grass area, there's tables, chairs, and it connects the two buildings. It's called the Jaywalk. It's pretty cool. Now. The original renderings for the Jaywalk 
was supposed to be athletic fields. It was supposed to be like soccer fields, baseball fields up there for the athletics. But then they kind of made it a public space for all of the students. You might notice these steps from episodes of Law and Order as well. You can see it looks a lot more modern in here, doesn't it? I've taken you guys here many times, but it's cool to see it again. Uh, this is the computer room. This used to be open 24 hours a day before the big C, COVID. Hey, look who it is, Fred, Fred X. What's going on, man? We're taking you back to school tonight. very quiet over here though you know if it's not that windy let's go all the way to the Hudson River Arby's is where is your house in southern Florida Miami uh, a man also says Tom what asset classes do you have most of your savings invested in for the long term US equities What about you? You know, so many people have been negative, obviously, uh, on US equities. And they've been recommending to buy you know, European stocks or, you know, emerging markets and things like that. But, you know, there's an old saying that companies are expensive for a reason and they're also cheap for a reason. So a lot of times the reason why U.S. tech companies, you know, people will complain about how they're so overvalued. It's not necessarily you're just paying for the company in many ways, right? You're paying for the protection, for the security, to have the governance, right? The company to operate under the governance of the United States of America, right? Where we have individual property rights, individual freedoms. It's not like that in a lot of other countries around the world. So people from all over the world pay a premium for that, right? You know, in some of these emerging markets, it's like, okay, could the government be throw, thrown over from a military coup tomorrow? Like, that's very unlikely to happen here. All right, everybody, this is new development, one West End. This is totally brand new. This was not here when I was going to college. I'll have to do a walking tour of this neighborhood when it's light out. But this is all brand new. I mean, this all used to be under construction. They've really transformed the west side in a major way. I mean, look at how nice this lobby looks. You have a nice fireplace to the right. This is the corner of West End Avenue and 59th. You have a little bit better view of the new building at John Jay. Yeah, DMs just go back, go to the back and see Waterline Square. I'm debating on doing that. I just don't know how windy it's going to be, but we'll check it out. Let's see.
A. Jefferson says, hey Tom, what is the best area slash neighborhood in Manhattan to live for someone on a budget who works in tech? That's a really hard question to answer because it really depends on what you'd like to do. Like what are some of the activities that you like? Um, Manhattan's a big place, you know. Um, give me a little more context. You know, what do you, what do you like to do? You know, what do you like to do for fun? Do you want to be closer to outdoor activities? Do you like Central Park? Do you like nightlife? Do you like the bar scene? Or like kind of what are your, you know, kind of parameters? Because each neighborhood is so diverse and unique in its own way. This is all brand new too. Now this is pretty much right on the Hudson River, guys. Uh, this is really, really nice. When the weather is beautiful. Hey, Jonathan from Florida. Thanks so much for stopping by and saying hello. We appreciate it. Oh, man. I don't know if I can walk here tonight. The wind is too much because you have the Hudson River right here and the wind is way too crazy so we'll have to turn back now even though these buildings are beautiful everything's all luxurious any the closer you get to the water in the winter i mean it's it's borderline brutal if you're gonna live here full time, right on the water. I mean, these wind gusts all year, all day, you know, it could be 40 miles an hour. It's crazy. And you don't, re you don't realize it until you're actually here. So I always tell clients, I'm like, look, make sure if you're looking at a place that's right on the water in Manhattan, make sure you actually go see those places in the winter. Because if you see them in the summer, you're gonna love it, right? Because it's absolutely gorgeous, you know, it's hot out, but in the middle of February or January, even December, even now, you know, having to wake up every day, you know, walk outside and trudge through, you know, 45 mile an hour wind gusts, after a while, it gets a little taxing. Let's just say that. All right, let me uh, plug in my phone because the battery's gonna die, it's so cold. Start to head downtown by 34th Street. Get a little bit of a walk. I don't know. Mimi says, do any of you really think that they'll seize Donald Trump's property in New York? Eh, I don't think so. And I think if they do, that's like really, really bad luck. Connors, Tom, what is the difference between the Dow Jones Industrial Average? 
and the S&P 500. Well, they're two different equity indices. Now the Dow Jones Industrial Average is a price weighted average, not a market capitalization weighted indice. And it's made up of 30 stocks. So I'll give you an, I'll give you a pretty good free resource that you should use. Uh, go ahead and go to slickcharts.com. So I'll say that again, go to slickcharts.com. And that's a really good website because it gives you the full breakdown of each individual stock that makes up the Dow Jones Industrial Average and the S&P 500. Now the S&P 500 is an indice that is a market capitalization weighted index, right? So it's weighted by market cap of the largest 500 companies in the United States. So the larger the market cap the company is, the higher the weighting in the index. Does that make sense? So there's a lot of talk about how, you know, this stock market's only really getting carried by seven stocks, the Magnificent Seven. That's because those are the stocks that have been performing the best and they have a huge market cap, right? So like Microsoft is the most valuable company and I believe it makes up over 7% of the entire index. so much uh, for your really kind $10 donations. Thank you for the walks. Thank you so much for donating and supporting the stream. Thank you. Thank you. So yeah, the, just remember the Dow is only made up of 30 stocks, 30 companies, which by the way, Amazon was just recently added to the Dow Jones Industrial Average. So welcome, Amazon. Um, but the S&P 500 is a market capitalization weighted index made up of the 500 uh, largest companies in the US. Somebody's talking about Reddit went public today. Yeah, I, didn't, I did not buy. Yeah, it is this way, yep. Uh, made up, uh, yeah, I, I didn't buy Reddit. I probably won't. Now, there's a good book. We, we recommended it earlier in the stream. It's called Life Cycle Trade, which gives you uh, a little bit of a better idea of initial public offerings, how they trade, why they trade the way they do, But in my view, right, um, I never really purchase IPOs within their first year of trading. all the car dealerships here you can see mercedes-benz across the street and to the right of us is dewitt clinton park let's start to cut in towards civilization a little bit. <laughs> Rockstar says Reddit is just a big old chat room, uh, not really a sustainable business model. I don't know anything about Reddit's earnings. I don't know anything about how much money they make. Um, 
I just know that this was the first social media company to go public since 2017, I believe, since Pinterest. Uh, anybody, okay, does anybody honestly use Pinterest? I think I've been on the website like five times. Uh, Fred X is bang left. We'll bang left right here. Um, I think I've used Pinterest like five times. It is publicly traded uh, under the ticker symbol PINS. Pins. I'm seeing a lot of nopes. Some people said no, yes. Now, do you guys remember seeing a lot of those horses and carriages by Central Park? I'm sure all of you remember that. This is where they go at night, right here. These are the horse stables. We'll check them out real quick. Someone says, I go to it when it comes up in search, but then find it's quite useless. <laughs> what, Pinterest or Reddit? Or, or maybe both. I don't know, Reddit's, Reddit's a good time sometimes. I've used it for like uh, career help and like coding help. You'd be surprised. If you go down the rabbit hole on Reddit, there's actually pretty good uh, um, career help and things like that. All right, here it is. These are the horse stables. You definitely smell it. You see them? Not a lot of people know this, but this is where they all go. So have you ever taken a horse and carriage ride? This is where they hang out, right next to DeWitt Clinton. See, Central Park Stables. Oh, Clinton Park Stables, excuse me. Now, in terms of how Reddit makes money, like, what is their business model? There's no subscription, right, to Reddit? Do they just sell advertising? I've obviously been on Reddit multiple times, but I don't really remember seeing any advertising. Anybody wanna chime in on that? Connor says ads. I don't think I've, I've seen not one ad on Reddit. Alright, so for everybody who frequently asks me about, hey Tom, I never really see any gas stations in New York City. I've not seen but one. Well, I'll take you to one right now. This is my old stomping grounds. You can have a gas station right on the left here. Now, whoever can guess, let me turn the camera this way, whoever can guess how much a gallon of gas costs in Manhattan uh, if we ever meet up in New York City I'll buy a steak from Del Frisco's so this is this is big steaks here this is for a Del Frisco's steak how much is a gallon of gas on the corner of West 51st Street and 11th Avenue in Manhattan anybody want to take a quick guess At this mobile gas station, 419, 427, 355. Trash average is 457. Let me 
see if any. I think somebody got it. I think the first person you said it got it. Wow, AUS Fly Girl. I think you might be the winner. Scrolling, scrolling. Yeah, I think AUS Fly Girl almost nailed it. That's so funny. Well, for a regular 529. Almost hit the nail on the head there, AUS Fly Girl. So regular is 529, extra is 559, and supreme is 629. So if you're ever curious where to get gas in New York City, this is, uh, I think, one of the first gas stations a lot of you guys have seen in, in Manhattan. And you're right next to Porsche. Oh, was it really in view? Maybe I just, maybe I just showed it. Anyway, we're gonna pass a couple more here as we go down. I mean, it's a totally different experience over here, right? On 11th. Pretty much if you're walking down 11th Avenue at nighttime, chances are you're not a tourist. You probably live here, you work in one of the dealerships, particularly during the winter, because it is quite cold here. But if you're all enjoying the live stream so far tonight, feel free to click the like button and subscribe if you're new. We do these live streams almost every single night starting at 8.30. Hey, TK Porsche. Uh, this is Tom, your comments please on the DOG suit today filed against Apple. Well, maybe that's reflected in the stock price because Apple was down big again today. I think it was down like three or four percent. But I don't know. I think at a point, companies just grow so massive that it's like, are they being anti-competitive? Could you consider them being a monopoly? And what is the borderline cutoff of government kind of overstepping its boundaries? I don't know. I think more broadly, one of my main concerns is the following. These companies like this is Cadillac, by the way. Uh, some of these companies like Apple, Microsoft, these huge tech conglomerates, they have so much money, they have so much cash that they could pretty much in and of themselves uh, be extremely anti-competitive, right? Because they could just, you know, threaten litigation on smaller competitors and essentially sue them into oblivion because Apple has unlimited money, right? So if they wanted to be anti-competitive, the best thing to do in the United States is just sue the hell out of somebody until they either get tired of dealing with the lawyers or they go bankrupt, right, from dealing with the legal fees. Or you just buy them out, you just buy out your competition. This thing looks pretty cool, right? Anybody in the chat on a Cadillac?
know, what are your thoughts on it? TK Porsche. Looks like somebody broke the window here. Now they can kind of get away with it because it kind of looks cool. But there's probably some person that uh, came up and smashed the window. Wow, I like the look of this SUV. This thing is actually pretty cool. Look at this place. <laughs> yeah, Carol H is probably why they left it like that. It kind of, it's a good look. Looks pretty cool. Now we're going to be doing uh, multiple live streams in the summer all the way by the Intrepid. It's just too cold and it's too windy to do it now, but that's a really, really fun area. So if you go to 42nd Street and continue to walk all the way to the west side until you can't go west anymore because you'll be in the water, uh, that is the Intrepid Museum. You know what? Let's see how windy it is. And then I'll show you guys. Maybe we could see one of the fighter jets on top of the Intrepid. Here's a car wash. Yeah, we'll look at it right now. Might as well. All of 11th Avenue used to look like exactly this these low-rise you know tow shops auto body shops car washes like really industrial this is what it all used to look like not really those you know big glitzy and glamorous skyscrapers so you get a peek at the old new york and then that's what it's become everything in the back it's an interesting contrast but there it is right in front of us this is the intrepid oh, i don't think there's internet over here Can you guys still hear me or is the internet out? I think we're probably buffering because there's no internet. All right, let's walk over the bridge. I'm taking you guys to like the real, the real, uh, the back roads. So this is gonna take us over the West Side Highway here, everybody. So we don't have to cross the street. It's this twisty, turny walking bridge. And here you can see the West Side Highway. Brandon Reed, thank you for Brandon Reed, thank you so much. So I'm a new subscriber watching from Broken Arrow, Oklahoma. Wow, what a cool name. Broken Arrow, Oklahoma. That's awesome.
Well, Broken Arrow, Oklahoma, welcome to New York City and the Intrepid. What do you guys think of the view all the way to New Jersey? This is the huge vacant lot overlooking Midtown Manhattan. Right, there it is. This is the Intrepid. And you can see those two Tomcat fighter jets up at the top. This is a real real aircraft carrier. You can actually go on it, take a tour. And look at this. You can see all the way to one Vanderbilt and the H&M building, as well as Bank of America Tower. Hey, hang with Mark Mom. Welcome to the west side of Manhattan. Yeah, we're checking out the Intrepid Museum tonight. God bless America, for sure. It's actually not as windy as I thought. Man, standing right under it's crazy. Those huge anchors. Wow, this, this angle is crazy.
pretty cool. This is Pier 84. I mean, walking all the way over to the west side tonight makes me really excited for the summer. Hey, Van, good to see you. Long time no see. Yeah, you know, now that the weather's getting nicer, I mean, the weather's horrible tonight, but uh, we're gonna be exploring some pretty cool neighborhoods. This is Hudson River Park. Yeah, but once things get a little bit nicer out, you know, I'm gonna take you guys down to Stone Street. We'll walk Battery Park. I mean, we're gonna go to all these crazy neighborhoods. We're gonna walk over, you know, every summer we do the same thing, right? Uh, we have Bridge Week. I'm not sure if you guys remember Bridge Week. It's kind of like an impromptu <laughs> walks in Wall Street tradition. One week out of the summer, we walk over every bridge in Manhattan, minus the George Washington Bridge. So we'll hit the 59th Street Bridge. We'll do the Brooklyn Bridge, uh, the Manhattan Bridge, and the Williamsburg Bridge. It's always a fun time. And now we're looking at the Hudson Yards. It's crazy to think how none of this used to be here. This big vacant area right here, that's where they're proposing to put the new casino. So it's gonna be a massive casino and hotel as well as residential and a public school. Crazy, right? I mean, what, a, uh, what an interesting comb combination. You have a casino, a hotel, and a public school. Now you can see a little bit of the spire of the Empire State Building. It's all lit up in red. Hey, Chris B. What's up? Now this is the westernmost side of the Jacob Javits Center. Now they spent a ton of money remodeling the entire Jacob Javits Center. We'll see what it looks like from the front here in just a moment. Huge convention center. They do the boat show. They do the car show. Comic Con is here. And this is the New York Waterway. You can take the ferry. But look at how crazy tall those buildings are at the Hudson Yards. That's insane. I think Steve Gold has a few trophy listings. And 
some of those really nice buildings in the Hudson Yards. I think when I get back to the train station, I gotta get a cup of coffee or something. All right, let's see if we can make this light. I think we'll just make it. This is 12th Avenue. Now this bike uh, bike lane that you see will take you all the way down to the World Trade Center. So if you're visiting New York City in the summer, this is one of the best things to do. You could bike around the entire perimeter of Manhattan and the views are just spectacular. It's really, really amazing. So trust me, take my advice. If you're coming here in the summer, go ahead and rent a city bike, come all the way to 12th Avenue and take this bike path where you see these bikers here. It'll, it'll literally drop you off right at the World Trade Center. It's the craziest view, biking directly under the Trade Center. This is Pier 76. Coming up just on the left here, this is where you can get the mega bus. I wouldn't recommend it, not a big fan of the mega bus. I have very, very deeply ingrained PTSD from the mega bus. But check that out, it's all the Hudson Yards. Yeah, the casino is proposed to be over the west side yard. So if you stand right at the Hudson Yards and you look as far west as you can, you'll actually see all the Long Island Railroad vehicles, or the cars, I should say, excuse me. Wow, look at how cool this is. Guys, you can see the vessel right here. I mean, this view looks crazy at night, but during the day, I mean, my God, it looks incredible. And you can even see the Empire State Building. Hey, Blues Rider, thank you so much for your very generous $10 donation. This for Tom's Cup of Joe Fund. Thank you, Blues Rider. Look at the spire on the Empire tonight. <laughs> Now these are some of the tennis courts. Imagine playing tennis at sunset in the summer overlooking the Hudson River. Insane.
All right, speaking of the mega bus, you can see one of the mega buses pulling into the station right now. And you have the spire of one Vanderbilt. I wonder where they're coming from. Ah, it's just Philadelphia. Oh my God, I could smell the mega bus. Brings back memories. I mean, it's a very cheap option. Sometimes it's as cheap as $1. But it's usually like 15, 20 bucks for the mega bus. But I mean, every time I've taken it, absolute horror stories. So I told myself I'd never take it ever again. All right, this is the Jacob Javits Center. Beautiful, all brand new. And now we've officially made it to the Hudson Yards. You're gonna see just how futuristic the Hudson Yards is now. I mean, this place is amazing. This is 55 Hudson Yards to the right. Everything is all modern, brand new. And right across from us, is 50 Hudson Yards. This is Black Rock's brand new headquarters. Now, if you watch the recent CNBC interview with Larry Fink, the CEO of Black Rock, they filmed it in their new headquarters. And in the background, you can see the vessel. It's a really, really cool, I don't know, it's cool to see it because we always live stream here. So go ahead, check that out. The brand new interview, uh, BlackRock CEO. 
CEO is talking about tokenization of assets. And you can see the, the vessel in the background, which is that huge structure right here. They also extended the seven train. So this is all brand new, 34th Street Hudson Yards Station. The seven train will now extend all the way to 34th Street and you can take it all the way to the last stop, Flushing Main Street, which is the largest Chinatown in New York City. A lot of people think the biggest Chinatown is in Manhattan. It's not, it's in Flushing. Look at how cool the lobby is. Beautiful. Now this was about a year and a half ago. We were doing a live stream right here before this opened, before BlackRock moved in. And we just so happened to run into the architect who designed this entire lobby. And we did an impromptu interview with him on the live stream. So you never know who you're gonna run into in Manhattan. Look at this huge spiral staircase here. Really, really stunning. As we round this corner, you're going to see the spire of the Empire State Building. But if you guys enjoyed that walk from uh, the Intrepid, I mean, I think we saw a lot of cool stuff tonight that we usually don't get the chance to check out. So if you enjoyed the Intrepid, if you enjoyed the Hudson Yards, feel free to leave a like on the video and subscribe to the channel if you're new. Again, we do these walks every day starting at 8.30 p.m. Eastern. I'll take you guys back to the Moynihan train hall. Just off to the right, really good coffee spot. It's called Black Fox Coffee. Very, very good. Look at this dining room. What a contrast from being outside in the freezing and dark.
so you'd almost you'd almost miss this coffee shop. It's right here. This one, Black Fox. All right, everybody. Well, I appreciate all of you coming out and enjoying Walks in Wall Street tonight. We'll be back tomorrow live from New York City. So again, if you enjoyed the stream, feel free to leave a like on the video and click the subscribe button if you're new. And we will see you all right back here tomorrow. If you want to subscribe to all of our free financial research, you can scan the QR code on your screen and punch in your email or type exclamation points news N E W S in the chat. And the Nightbot will drop the link to our Substack. We send out all of our financial research every other Thursday, right as the market closes. So feel free to check us out over there on Substack. Thanks so much, everybody, and we will see you all tomorrow. Brandon Meld, Fred X, Chris B. Always a bull market somewhere. You just need to know where to look. Take care, everybody.